Welcome to Musicians vs. the World, the podcast where we explore aspects of music and musician life that may not have been covered in music school. I am your host, Christine Smith. Now, in our last episode, we spoke with composer Pat Irwin about his work on the score for Dexter New Blood. We talked about his composing process and how he created um, a sonic soundscape for that hit show. And a name that kept on coming up was the name of Patrick Duravez. And it came up because I was gushing about the mix and how the mix really supported the music throughout that score and really enhanced and let us hear everything that was happening in that score. And then Pat actually said the following about Patrick. He's a real talent. I've worked with him since Rocco's Modern Life. He's done everything I've done. I can't imagine working on something without him. I couldn't do it without him. I wouldn't do it without him. And so I thought, well, we can't talk about Dexter Newblood without him. So I have asked him to come and speak with us about his side of making that score and to talk to us about mixing and um, producing and the other side of creating an album or a score after the musicians are recording it. So he was so generous to come and speak with us today. And I'm gonna give you a little background information about him. Patrick Derivaz composes, performs, records, mixes and produces a wide range of innovative and cross-cultural styles of music. He has worked with artists such as Philip Glass, Erica Badu, A Tribe Called Quest, Jeff Buckley, Charles Mingus Band, among many others. He has taught and currently lectures at FIT and NYU and was the artistic director and vice president of Musicians for Harmony from 2002 to 2008. His work includes the design and creation of all sonic elements and music for the Audubon Society in New York and the Creative Kids Museum in Calgary, Canada. He has served as front of house sound engineer in major US clubs, the Barclays Center Stadium, and in outdoor festivals, including Summer Stage in Central Park. In addition, Patrick's compositions have been performed in the US and France, receiving reviews in the New York Times, and he was a featured composer on WNYC Soundcheck. And he has, currently, he has recently worked with Pat Irwin on the score of Dexter New Blood, which was the most streamed television show in history. So, Patrick, thank you so much for being here, and welcome to Musicians vs. the World. Oh, thank you very much for having me. Thanks. I, yeah, I am so excited to have you here. Mm. I just loved, um, like I said, when I was listening to the Dexter score, I heard your mix and the way you placed everything and how it just amplified Pat Irwin's composition in such a beautiful way. It just complemented each other so well. Um, I just, I just loved it. I think that takes so much talent. Why, why is it that you decided to become a mixing engineer and a producer and all of those things? Uh, at first, I mean, it's just like I started in the music when I was a, when I was a kid, and I started playing uh, rock and roll bands and uh, blah blah blah, listen to all type of music, and then eventually uh, I went to the conservatoire and I study uh, bass. Uh, composition, uh, solfege, uh, harmonies. And also at that time, we were starting in the conservatoire in France, we were studying electroacoustic music and music concrete. So that includes recording also sounds and uh, not just music, but sound in general and trying to figure out a way to work with that. And that's, that is something that I really up to this day really excite me and uh, interest me. So after graduating from school, I was working also during, during that time, I was working also as a DJ in a nightclub and I was uh, having people dancing on music from disco to punk, who, who was uh, like starting at that time, to uh, soundtracks to jazz in a nightclub. I was having people dancing on all this type of music <laughs> because the way I was able to uh, to change them to uh, one and into another, so that was kind of fun to have like people uh, like dancing on Tech Five, for example, from Deb <laughs> Brubeck to uh, uh, like a, like, a, like a show like Manny's or Chef, <laughs> and then to uh, God Save the Queen, and then <laughs> we're Saturday Night Fever. So <laughs> it's just like, for me like uh, kind of like mixing music styles and uh, uh, ideas uh, was always interesting. And it's just like a, after spending some time in London with that uh, punk movement and I was 
I was living at that, at that time with my friend Henry Padovani, who was the first guitar player in the police. So we mm. were together at that time. And then we were squatting, basically, in, uh, <laughs> in London, which was a really fun time. There's so many uh, great bands that happened at that time, and the music was uh, so exciting. Mm-hmm. So that was my beginning in the, in the music and recording and things like that. And then I moved to New York. And after a while uh, in New York, just a little, little while, I was just like a fun walk in a recording studio also. Because a friend of mine had a studio where uh, I was uh, uh, going as a musician to, uh, to record my music. And then he uh, offered me a job as, a, as an assistant engineer first and then eventually as a, a chief engineer in the studio. So I get to work with all different type of people different type of music and also at that time also with the beginning of hip-hop with people like Tribe Called Quest or uh, uh, the uh, um, uh, De La Soul and all those all those guys so there was a also a different type of music and but a very interesting time in New York also and I keep working also and working in the studio I was uh, in contact with Philip Glass and all different composer like Alvin Lucier in a more uh, world uh, different type of music so it's just like it's uh, all those connections with different style of music that uh, that interest me and uh, I keep going I keep doing it <laughs> and I try to combine always the uh, all the different styles and uh, different uh, influences of music in my uh, in my work I, d- I don't want to be a uh, stuck in a, in a corner where okay patrick is good as a mixing engineer or recorder for rock and roll music or for classical music or whatever right i love all type of music so i just like uh that's what i want to do i want to work with all different type of people different type of ideas that's mm-hmm. it <laughs> so is the recording and mixing process different for different genres of music it is yeah mm-hmm. it is i mean you just like you you can use the same equipment, the same type of uh, microphone, quite often, mm-hmm. but it's it is a different type of uh, different type of approach. I mean, you can uh, classical musicians will uh, uh, try to avoid uh, sound that are too manipulated. I mean, you cannot really EQ or uh, do like crazy panning or whatever. With the classical music is just like. Okay, it's just like you have the string quartet, and it's just like it's a, that's the way it's organized. Sometimes they switch the cello to the viola or whatever, but it's uh, usually it's just like you cannot like put the first violin on one side and the, 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 and then in the middle switch around. Like, <laughs> to create the, no, so as opposed to the to all diff- different type of music like rock and roll, you can you can change the way people are like. If you go to see a band, you see a band on stage, it's a certain way. It may not be the same way in a recording because you have different things. You have overdubs also. So you create different layers of sounds that you need to figure out how to, in a, in your oral field, or where you're going to position them in order to avoid uh, filtering of uh, certain frequencies or whatever and to create a more wider image. It's a different approach from uh, one type of music to another. Same thing with uh, hip hop. It's just that you're gonna you're gonna use more like a sub f- uh, frequencies in hip hop that you will not use in uh, definitely not in classical music, <laughs> but uh, to a certain extent in rock and roll also. Mm-hmm. Well, I think of like Philip Glass classical music. I I would imagine he was a little bit more experimental with the things about placing different things in different sounds in different areas maybe that and also the the fact that he's uh, always pretty much for the past uh, 30 years also is always using layers of music meaning he has like uh, the classical ensemble and also synthesizer mm-hmm. playing the same the same type of music mm-hmm. so you have like the violin cello uh, bass and so on and so forth but you also have the violin, cello, bass, and so forth played on the synthesizer. So mm. you create you create those layers, and they're quite interesting. Mm-hmm. Yeah, quite, it makes it's it quite fun to do that. Like, yeah. yeah, I bet it. I bet it is, and I bet it's mm-hmm. fun to be. I'm just thinking of 
working with a tribe called Quest to be on that front line of a whole new genre of hip hop. And that must have been really exciting for you to be right there. Yeah, it's fun. It was really fun because it's just like you had those people creating a, a new sound, a new uh, new approach to music. And uh, and uh, I really respect the, those people. And I, I was lucky enough to, to throughout my life to, to be working with people that are really honest in, in what they're doing. It's just like they're not pretending to be something. They're just like, uh, that's what they did. They were born to do. That's that's what they are. And mm-hmm. so they're just like, that's their job. They're doing their job. <laughs> so it's fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> and then your job is, it takes an incredible amount of talent and just your ear being trained to listen for certain things. Um, how did you develop that? age <laughs> practice right exactly. yeah. no you, i mean it's it's like a, when you start to learn like uh, my, my main instrument is the bass uh-huh. but it's even harder on the violin or on the cello it's just like depending of how much you pressure you put on the string you're going to change the pitch if you if you slightly move your 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 finger you're going to be a quarter of a ton up or down or a half a ton up or down. <laughs> so it's just like you just like to, to train your ear. Same thing with uh, with frequencies and panning and uh, the depth that you can create with that. It's just like mm-hmm. a question of uh, error and trial. You just mm-hmm. like step by step, you learn it. Mm-hmm. And eventually it kind of like becomes a second nature and you just like you, you can make decision faster. Mm-hmm. Than, yeah. So what is the difference between um, like a producer and a mixing engineer? What is, what's the different jobs of those, those two things? Are, those are pretty much, now they're pretty much the, the, the same thing. But the, you know, the engineer, the mixing engineer, recording engineer is more on the technical side of the, the, the window. The, uh, the producer is more, has generally more of a charge of the overall project. Meaning that the the way songs are going to to be uh, orchestrated or arranged, the way they are going to be uh, uh, put together on an album or compilation or whatever, but quite often the the two roles intermingle. So it's uh, very difficult to say. Uh, I'm the engineer. He's the producer, or she's the engineer. I'm the producer, and so on. So it's just like quite often it it works different way. It mm-hmm. used to be that uh, you you had like the real separation between uh, the engineer and the producer. The producer, uh, let's say, with, with people like uh, Arif Mardin and all those guys, they were uh, or Quincy Jones. They were really like coming into the session. They had like the musician selected and so on and so forth. And then they will be able to to write the music that they need to play, or if they hear something that didn't work in the arrangement or, or the the orchestration, they will on the spot write different type of uh, music for different part of uh, for different instruments. So that uh, that has changed, but it's it's still a uh, it's still kind of like that also because it's just like with uh, creating beats and uh, uh, samples, mm-hmm. you can you can get it to the same uh, pretty much the same type of uh, ideas. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. Now, just to explain, I don't know if many musicians really understand the importance of a good mix and how much that helps and how creative it is. So can you kind of explain what makes a really good mix? It, uh, it's it's quite subjective also, because uh, it, it, depending on the, the type of music, it's just like you want, you want things to be distorted or uh, ugly. <laughs> <laughs> like say, for, for classical music, you, you're striving to... Uh, to a purity of sound mm-hmm. and uh, the the placement, like I, like I was saying before, the placement, like the orchestration is just like, okay, you have the first violin there and so on. Mm-hmm. It goes like this. So that, you, as an engineer, you need to, and mixer, you need to keep that in mind. So if you're working with classical music, you have to respect the way people are playing on stage. So that's one one thing. But then you need also to treat the instruments as natural as possible. 
getting like the, the right position for the microphone, not to hear too much of a bow, too much of the rosin on the strings and so on. So all this is one thing that's specific for one type of music. Then you go into the rock and roll and then you have more distortion, louder and <laughs> so you adapt to this type of uh, this type of music also and get to uh, what people uh, the artist envision the music to be and should be so let's let's kind of switch into dexter you were talking about um keeping the vision of the artist in mind when you're mixing what was the vision for dexter and that score when uh, we had some meeting first before actually starting to uh, to really record and uh, mix for the for dexter and the uh, the show from the previous seasons is quite different. I mean, it's just like from uh, Miami, sunny, and uh, moving upstate New York, where it's called. And it is called in New York at the moment also. <laughs> so it needed, it needed to be uh, uh, getting that cold feeling and also uh, the music for, for me and for, for us in, uh, also needed to be more felt than, uh, than heard. So my challenge was to find a way to uh, get what Pat was giving me and to, uh, to create that uh, darker feeling. Pat had it also on, on his, uh, the way he, uh, he, he uh, composed the music, but the final uh, mix was really the, the place where you, you can feel all those uh, sub-frequencies and the, the, the panning and the, the moving, creating that kind of like where is that going? You can, you kind of like, it's scary there. <laughs> it's just like, I, I don't find the, I, I don't, I don't find the stable place there where I can stay. It's just like, wow. So it's basically that, that's what it was. It's just like Pat was giving me the mixes that were approved by the network. His mixes, work mixes that were approved by the network. And then it was mm -hmm. up to me to then create the depth and the, the movement. The, the positioning of things in uh, in regard to the to the visual and to the dialogue and the uh, sound effects. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was it was fantastic. So when you talk about depth in a mix, what do you mean by that? You just like it, it. It's the way you have like things with level panning being in front of you or a little further back or sideways, and creating with like a, like panning, auto pan or manual panning, where you have things moving around. The, the, for example, there is a, quite often there is a, like a, a, a feedback on the, on the guitar that was uh, quite often specific to, a, to a, some of the image of a, a Dexter in, in, in the film that started in one place and that moved around to the other side slightly as we go, as we go along on the cue. So it's just like you, you create different movement there. And uh, by level, but with the levels also, of some of, some of the EQs you can create the the depth between the instruments. Yeah, and so for people who don't know, the EQ is the different frequencies, um, some of the lower that frequencies and some of the yes, higher frequencies, like and adjusting them. Yeah, so the, mm -hmm. you uh, you EQ the frequency, meaning like you you change, add or cut some of the low frequency, the mid frequency, the high frequency, and all those uh, in between. Mm -hmm. And you, create, you so, create the room also for the for the dialogues and the sound effects, which is the most important things when you're watching a right. TV show or film. <laughs> right. Although I do like to listen to the music when I'm I, watching. I, I do. Also, <laughs> but it, it's, uh, it's just like it. the, the music is really uh, complementary to the it, it it creates another layer of uh, emotions and uh, feelings when uh, when it's uh, properly done it works really great with uh, adding to the uh, to the overall uh, experience mm -hmm. if it's too loud yeah. that's it's just like for me sometimes it's just like a, i just turn off the tv or the the, the, the film i get out of the film because the music is too loud and it's disturbing it's, it shouldn't mm. be yeah, it takes away from it exactly. rather than adding to it. Yeah. So did you have a copy of the film when you were 
mixing that you could yeah, follow. Yeah. yeah, yeah, we had a we had films, and sometimes we had like a to go back and redo some of the work we've done because it's just like they change a cut on 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 the film, and so we have to to work with that. But the way it works is Pat or whoever I'm working with give me the uh, the network approved cues. So I have that on my computer with the dialogues and the sound effects and the music from the from the composer. So I listen to the music from the composer, see what I, what is his or her vision is for that, that particular piece of music, create a mix that I think do justice to what the composer is looking for. Then I put the dialogues and the sound effects and change whatever you positioning uh, that I had done previously in order to, uh, to accommodate priority for the dialogues and the sound effects. Mm. I didn't realize that you had, you had changed some of the, you know, the panning where you move it with the sound from one side to the other. I didn't realize that, that you did that to match the, the visual. Yep. I think that's, Yes, yeah, that's so really neat. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that even adds an extra extra layer to that. Yeah. So you've been working with Pat Irwin for years. How did you two get together? Yeah. We worked together, I guess, I believe 25, 30 years ago. We started working together. That was on uh, Roku's Modern Life. That was a fantastic, fantastic cartoon. But at that <laughs> time, it was just like insane because... We had a lot of music. Pat is a very prolific composer, also. It's just like very oh, oh my goodness! And yes. uh, sometimes uh, people take advantage of that and have him do more music than necessary. But we had like a lot of music to record, and at that time everything was done live with musicians in the studio. And one day, we had to record all the music in one day, mixing it the same day and make it to FedEx last call to send the, the, the mixes to the to the network. In one day? In one day. <laughs> Did you do it? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Wow. It was, That's a lot of talent in everybody oh, yeah. involved no, in we, that. I mean, the, the, the group of musicians that we had was fantastic. And they are still fantastic. They're still, those guys are still playing around. And, but like starting like nine o'clock in the morning till about eight on I forgot what what the last time for pickup for FedEx was, but it was just like incredible. Oh my goodness. Yeah. <laughs> that makes uh makes you grateful for the internet. Oh yeah, definitely. <laughs> <laughs> and I mean at that time we, we were we were not working on computer. We were working the computer was just like a, also starting at that time, we were working with EDATs. Oh, really? Yeah, those eight tracks, uh, video cassette. Yeah. We had like, I think three of them chained together, and we were mixing to that after that. Really? Yeah. <laughs> wow. So, do you um, do you enjoy mixing now better in the digital age, oh, or do you yeah. like the analog? No, I, I mean, I, I'm not nostalgic about analog. It's just like it's. It does sound different to a certain extent than uh, than digital, but it's it it just uh, doesn't matter. It's how you use it, and if you know how to use equipment, then it doesn't matter if it's analog or digital. If you have like a ten thousand dollars microphone or a hundred dollar microphone, if you know how to use it, you should be able to get good sounds. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's it. <laughs> and that comes from practice. Exactly. Yeah. And not being yeah, not well, being stuck also just like like I say, it's just like yeah, like a four thousand or ten thousand dollars microphone can be good, but it may not be appropriate for everything. It's, right. It can be great on a whatever, let's say like a violin or a cello, it can sound fantastic. And you put it in front of an, an electric guitar, it's not gonna work. And you put it in front of a rap singer, it's not gonna work. So just like knowing your uh, your equipment and uh, what the equipment can do also, that's very important. 
Mm, yeah, yeah, that's true. And I know that Pat trusts you implicitly with his music. Um, how do the two of you work together? What's your process as you work together on these different projects? It's usually the, pretty much the, the same thing. I mean, we we get together before starting uh, like a, like a show, or whatever, and uh, he gave me some uh, some ideas, show me some 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 stuff that he recorded, and I say, well, that, that can be cool. That's uh, that's, uh, that's a little less cool, but whatever. And uh, then it goes into the to the network. The network say, okay, we like that. We don't like this. Blah, blah, blah. He works on uh, on his end to uh, to do what uh, what's needed from the network, and then he send me his mix, his work mix, and it's up to mm-hmm. me then to because uh, I mean he, I guess after this year we we can trust each other. He trusts me to <laughs> take it to the to the next level. So it's just like uh, up to me to uh, like I say, it's just like okay, move things here and there. EQ some certain things because of the dialogues or the sound effects. Mm-hmm. Raise the level, this, uh, lower the level, and mm-hmm. that's uh, that's the way to to mix stuff. And then adding some yeah. uh, some uh, special effects, uh, depending of the the cue that's needed. Some like uh, like I say uh, on Dexter, I use a lot of uh, not a lot, but a quite a quite a bunch of uh, low frequencies. That's just like you cannot really really hear it, but you can feel them. You can feel yeah. it. So yeah. just like uh, that's uh, that's uh, that's the interesting part of that uh, particular show. It's just like it's just like you had, you had like that gut feeling, like oh something's gonna happen. <laughs> <Just> like, <laughs> and you don't really see it or hear it, but you, your body feels it. It's just like that's the that's one thing also that you that you learn. Maybe not especially with a in the music field, but. Certain area of your body works with certain frequencies, so you just like you 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 learn. I mean, I learned about that also. It's just like okay, you want to create so, certain feelings. You you will use certain instruments or certain frequency to trigger different area in your body. Also, okay. So, what is the scary frequency that you used for well, Dexter? Do you remember the, the, what it is? The, the square fre- the, the frequencies are the, all those low frequencies. Just the yeah, low ones? Are, okay, there's not like a specific like... No, there is not a... Like, <laughs> like 150? There, there may, maybe, but it's just like it's just like you know that some of, some of those frequencies are going to trigger some emotions in your body. Yeah. I mean, just like like you have like a line, for example, on the cello. Uh, that's gonna it's gonna be in a certain frequencies it's gonna talk mm-hmm. to your heart more than uh, yeah. more than your brain you play the same line on the flute or on a on a violin but it's gonna be a different register and it's gonna trigger certain reaction in your brain instead of your heart yeah so oh, you, you work you learn to to work with that i i mean for me as a composer and uh, and mixer and engineer I, I learned how to work with this uh, this uh, different frequency, different emotion, and different way the body reacts. Yeah. Well, where did you learn about all of that? Just from trial and error as you're composing. That and also you you read about all different uh, different uh, subject in life also. Oh. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's, it's just God. like it has to do also since we're there. It has to do like with the with the chakras that you have in your body. That reacts to the to certain frequencies. Oh, okay. Mm-hmm. So you mm-hmm. learn to use those things. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I was actually going to ask you about your composing because you are you're an accomplished composer as well. Mm-hmm. Um, what are some of the things that what's what are some of the things that you enjoy composing? Do you have a certain genre or a certain style that you like writing? Not not especially. Just like I say, it's just like it's for me. It's like a music in general. It's just like. I don't want to be stuck in one corner, so it's just like uh, whatever. I'm happy to work with a uh, with a commercial for uh, planters or whatever, or Miller Miller beer, or and I can work in uh, some kind of like a more uh, esoteric type of uh, documentary or movie, whatever. It's just it's as long as I'm uh, interested in a in a subject, and I can uh, I can contribute. To make it something 
better for that particular uh, things, then I'll go for it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, when you are composing, do you do your own mixing or do you collaborate and no, hire I do, someone I do, else? I do my mixing also. Yeah, I can imagine that'd be hard to trust somebody else. No, no, I just... No? no. Okay, it, it's okay. because it's it's always kind of uh, fascinating to see what people also can come up with. It's just like, oh, mm -hmm. I never think about that. that, uh, that that'd be, uh, yeah, that's a good idea. And it's just like, it, it opens new doors. And it's just like, okay, next time I try different things. Yeah. Yeah. And it kind of like makes you look at something. I guess it's kind of like watching a chess game versus playing in the chess game when you're like the one in it, you don't see some exactly. things that maybe someone yeah. outside. Yeah. And that's why it's just like when you're, uh, when you're mixing, not, uh, the recording process is different, but when you're mixing, it's just like, okay, like I was telling you, you start to mix the music with that listening to the dialogues or the sound effects and getting an, an ID feedback from the visual that's happening at, a, at that cue. So you start to mix the music in order to make it as good as you think it should be. But then you step back and you listen with the dialogues and the sound effects that change everything. Not everything, but it's just like you need to readjust them. Then you need to take a step back a minute break or two minute breaks and then you come back and you listen again and you say, oh no that sucks <laughs> just like i need to change that and uh no 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 that needs to be a little a little further back because i cannot hear the voice there or it's just like the frequencies are just clashing with the voice so it's just like you you need to have like a little room where you can just like step back and kind of clear your your ears come back and listen to it again it's a, always a always a process, and it's a discipline that sometimes you. It's difficult to uh, to have because it's just like, I need it to I need it now, <laughs> and I need it yesterday. It's just like especially with a uh, with like uh, TV shows. It's just like sometimes the, the schedule is insane. Like I was mentioning, yeah. for like uh, like Roper's Modern Life. It's just like very uh, mm -hmm. very demanding. Have you ever come up? Well, I guess Rocco's Modern Life that sounded like an insane deadline. But when you when you come across these very very fast deadlines, what are some things that you do? Um, how do you how do you handle that? Well, you 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 try to adapt and figure out a way to make it work for for that deadline. Or if it's impossible, you just have to explain to uh, whoever is asking for that that it is not possible. It's just like, it's not humanly physically possible to do it and explain the reason and hopefully that person will understand it and uh, have the possibility to do something different but sometimes it's just like you, you you really cannot because it's just like let's say for example you record a piece of music with a couple of musicians or like a like an entire orchestra and then suddenly they decide to change slightly the cue and the orchestra mm. is gone, and no, yeah, like sorry. what do you do? Like, we cannot call back forty people to come and record, and it's not feasible. No, so it's just like yeah. you, you try to, to you try to find a way to accommodate, but it's just like sometimes there is no no possibility to do it. So, mm -hmm. yeah, and when they trust you, then they you know when you say something's not possible, then they are usually, trusting you that usually, you're right. Yeah. Okay, if he yeah. says it's not. Yeah. No, yeah. I mean, some, I mean yeah. it's just like uh, I remember one day, not for for I was I forgot which show it was, but I had finished the mixes and I was on my on in a car on my way to Montreal, and I received a phone call from the music editor saying, "Oh, I need that to be changed." Can you oh, send while it? you're in the car, can you send it to me right now? And I say, "Sorry, I'm on a car and uh, I'm on my way to Montreal, and I'll be back in two days." <laughs> Ah, okay. How and did he handle fine. What did they say? <laughs> oh, okay, good. <laughs> so they found another way to do it. And that, that, was, that worked out. So it's just like sometimes oh. there's a, not a possibility to do things. Mm -hmm. 
So now you did the mix for the TV show, Dexter, but there's also the album, which I know that there were some cues in there that were not in the show. Did you do a different mix for the two? Uh, they're, uh, they're basically the same. It's like, like, cause, uh, like I was telling you, my process is just like I try to work with the music being as best as it could as a piece of music and then adapt it to, uh, to the show. For the, uh, for the uh, uh, album soundtrack, I took the uh, mixes from the TV show and then work on that without any visual or dialogues or sound effects and see what I can change slightly to make it work as a piece of music only. Trying to respect as much as possible the, the panning and the, the movement that I create on the show also. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because I remember there's this one, there's this one, I guess, instrument, there's this one sound that seems to pan and move the same way every time mm -hmm. it comes up in different tracks. Yeah. Um, well, now that, now that you say your process, I'm wondering if it's because there was like an element in the show that kept recurring there. But, um, but in the album itself, I thought that it created a huge cohesion between the tracks, which really made the album yeah. seem like a complete work of art as well. So was, is, did you think about that in there or was that ma mainly because of the, of the video? No, that was, I mean, again, like all the placement, uh, if you listen to the first two episodes of uh, Dexter, it's just like you get, you get a sense of where is each uh, instrument, each sound should be uh, in the field. So from there, all the other all the other tracks, all the other episodes were treated with that in mind. It changes slightly. Mm, okay. It varies a little bit from one to another. Like I say, it's just like, well, that guitar can move from uh, from, from one side to slightly to the other or opposite or whatever, depending on the visual. But mm -hmm. then when I, when I worked on the uh, soundtrack album, then I had a little more freedom. It's just like, no, it, it doesn't have to be stuck in that corner. For that time, mm -hmm. it's just like it can move slightly, depending of what's happening around it. Also, so yeah, mm -hmm. it was beautiful the way that you put all of that, and I think it brought out a lot of Pat's composition as well. He had so many different ideas yeah. and going, and the way that you mixed, I thought, really brought that out really beautifully. Yeah, that's uh, that's the that's the idea. It's just like trying to f to figure out what his ideas musically were. And also the uh, the producers for the for the show were with the, the, their uh, storyline and the visual that they had. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I well congratulations <laughs> on it. I think it was <laughs> it was very fun to listen to. Yeah. Um, so, what should musicians know as they come to you and they want to record something? What's something that they don't usually think about, but would really be helpful to create the best product for them? Well. Musician, I'm kind of fortunate because I usually work with a very uh, high caliber type of musicians. But uh, quite often, beginner musicians will go into a studio and uh, have a rough idea of what they want to do. They rehearse a little bit, maybe, and they're expecting magic to happen there. Just like, <laughs> no, that doesn't work like that. You have to uh, to have a, a discipline and just like as a recording engineer or mixing engineer, you're going to, I mean, if you're serious about what you're doing, you're going to try to, to get the best product possible, the best thing you can for what the person is bringing to you. But if you have something that's terrible to start with, it's it's not gonna work. So it's just like uh, <laughs> people can cannot really expect to have like a, a platinum uh, record if they not, don't put the work into it. Every every good engineer, uh, mixer, producer will do their best for the clients, definitely. But. The client has to do the best for himself also and get get ready. 
before going into the studio. And that's that's include like also learning the process of recording. And that is, uh, I mean, I have so many experience where the people come into the studio with no experience. And then they put the headphones on and they sing into a good quality microphone. And it's just like, they freeze because they can hear everything, every little detail, the, the saliva in their, their mouth, uh-huh. the noise that can be going around there, the, the chair cracking. And <laughs> they're just like, stop, that's it. And they cannot do anything else. So it's just like, you have to learn. It's a learning. It's a, again, it's a learning process also. You have to learn how to, to be in a studio. It's completely different than being on stage. On stage, you're there, you're performing, mistake, it passes, and it's done. In the studio, you have to go back and fix that because it's going to be recorded and it's going to be heard vita mitanam after that. Mm-hmm. So, but I, I do, I do believe that people that are uh, recording, mixing, and producing for other people are basically very honest people and they try to do their best for their uh, for the musicians for for the artist or for the project that they're working on yeah Mm -hmm. yeah so there's a certain amount of if your engineer tells you something listen listen to them and do what they say yeah usually it's just like if 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 i hear something that's on the on the engineer side if i hear something that's distorted or not uh write for a, for a reason or whatever as a composer also because it's the modulation is not right or whatever it's just like i will tell that person and uh, if they're serious about what they're doing they're going to listen to it and they say yeah you're right or you're right but it's something that i want to do because sometimes distortion or uh, like you're playing, uh, you're playing a second against uh, another note. Sometimes it's just like not right, but it's just like it can be right also. So okay. you just have to yeah, to, to, expl- to explain the, your uh, your process and your uh, your ideas and exchange it and see uh, see what comes up. Mm-hmm. I love that. Yeah. So I think working with a good engineer and trusting them and coming really prepared. Those are all. Excellent, excellent things that all musicians should know, regardless of genre. Because the better you are as a musician, the better prepared you are as a musician, the better product you're going to exactly. get. Exactly. I mean, it's, again, it's just like again for the for recording, it's a it's a different process than performing. It's totally different. The, the performance is just like you have the audience. The audience is uh, reacting. It's feeding you there in your you're you're having the exchange with the audience on the recording hey you have the exchange with yourself there and it can be <laughs> tough can be really tough so i can imagine as long as you're yeah. you're well prepared well rehearsed then you're in a good shape definitely yeah 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 well i have just so enjoyed talking with you and learning about you and learning from you um, what last piece of advice do you have for musicians that either want to be engineers or just musicians in general? What sort of advice do you have for, for them? I guess uh, for me, it's just like listen to music, a lot of music, different music, not just one specific type of music. It's just like I love classical music. I was trained also in classical music, but at the same time, rock and roll is fine. Hip hop is great, also. World music is fantastic. I mean, it's one day I was recording a, a Chinese musician and he was playing some weird instruments, and he was just like, wow, it's fantastic. It's just like never seen something like that. And then suddenly, out of nowhere, he take a little piece of a, a pepper, like a, a candy wrap, and start playing music with that. And it was just like, that's it. <laughs> I mean, it's, <laughs> That's it's just awesome. like you have to accept, and it's uh, the, the same thing with uh, with electroacoustic music or music concrete. Right. It's just like you have to learn that sound is the the idea. It's not just mm-hmm. notes. Mm-hmm. 
it's just sound that you have to work with. And mm -hmm. the silence also. The silence is very important also. The way you integrate mm -hmm. the sound and the silence, melodies and so on, and rhythm also. But yeah. listen to a lot of different types of music. That's what uh, I would suggest. That's fabulous. Wonderful <laughs> advice. Thank you so much. Okay. So, Patrick, oh, go ahead. Yes. No. Okay. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Good. All right. Well, Patrick Derivez, thank you so much for being here. I just so appreciate you being so gracious to, to come oh, and teach it was us. A pleasure. Today. Really. Yeah. It was wonderful to meet you. Thank you. Mm -hmm.